Today, on our third installment of Hacking with Arduino, we'll bust VPNs by gathering the nearby Wi-Fi networks and sending them to a tracking server on this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. In our last several guides on hacking with Arduino, we've used a $1 Digispark to do all sorts of nefarious things. Today, we're going to push that even further by doing something even more interesting in my opinion, which is gather the nearby Wi-Fi networks that are close to a device we want to monitor. Now, the reason this might be useful is because we can tie these networks to a location. In fact, Google used to drive around, and when they were taking Google Street View, they were also recording the location of all the Wi-Fi networks around, allowing you to easily pinpoint your location using something called a GPS or assisted GPS. Now, this works the other way as well. If I know the networks that are near you, I can locate you generally, provided that those locations have been indexed before by Google or somebody on Wiggle Wi-Fi. Now, in order for this to work, we'll need a Digispark, and we're also going to be using Grabify to send the requests. And we're going to modify the payload we've used in previous versions to work to basically defeat the VPN by sending the user's location. Once we have the Digispark ready to go, you can check out the Nullbyte article linked in the description if you need help or run into any problems and need some troubleshooting. Once that's ready, then we can begin. Today, we're going to dive into some research I've done on low-cost attacks against things like macOS computers. And this is going to be the culmination of some of our previous guides, where we've developed our payload a little bit further, and now we're looking to do some pretty nasty persistent tracking that the user wouldn't notice and would really be able to get past even security considerations like a VPN. Now, to underscore that, I'm being, going to be connected to Pia the entire time, and I'm going to specifically go, let's see, let's do Texas. So if anybody were to get me with a payload that I developed before, which just maybe gives my IP address, then uh, you know if we're connecting to a tracking server, it's just going to get the VPN's IP address. So we've already defeated one of the things that might be able to track our computer by using a VPN like Pia. Now, let's say we want to step this up. Uh, there is a payload that I've created that will do this. And there is a system call on Mac OS in the terminal that is a little bit confusing to me. If you run this, it will go ahead and actually give you a list of all the nearby wireless networks, and this doesn't require sudo. Now the command is system library private frameworks apple 802.11.framework versions current resources airport tac s. When we run it, we get a whole bunch of stuff that our production assistant has to blur out, but most importantly, it will tell us relatively the location of where that person is by us taking any of these SSIDs or BSSIDs, putting them into something like Google, uh, Wiggle Wi-Fi or using a Google search API, and boom, we can get that person's location. So really, this should be treated like uh, location data and locked down as such because we don't even really use uh, straight up GPS anymore when we're getting a location. Most people on most devices use a GPS or assisted GPS, which actually figures out your location by the wireless networks around you. So it's a pretty efficient way of actually getting someone's location. And this payload that we've created today is going to do a great job of that. Now, the crux of how this works is we're going to be packaging this data into a request that we send to Grabify. And hopefully, I've created a bunch of def uh, decoy networks. Hopefully, we'll be able to pass this request along, even with a bunch of uh, garbage data thrown in there, and persistently track this computer. Now, the really insidious thing is we're going to be scheduling this as a job that repeats every 60 seconds. So as soon as we're done with this command, uh, we're basically going to be able to create something that's injectable into a macOS computer that will check in every 60 seconds and give us all the Wi-Fi networks that are around them pretty scary stuff, and especially when you can do it on such a cheap device. So let's get started. Now we're going to go ahead and go to Google Chrome and, well, or whatever browser you want. I actually recommend Firefox. It turns out Google is rolling back some of their privacy features when it comes to browser extensions, and that sucks. But anyway, uh, Digitrack, that's that's what we're doing. So github.com slash skikar slash Digitrack, and you'll find the repository for the research I've done on Arduino-based attacks against Mac OS devices. 
Now, of these two, we're gonna be using this one today. So we need to keep in mind the way that this is updated, which is unlike a regular Arduino. We're gonna write the code, we're going to uh, select upload, and then, and only then, will we plug it in. Otherwise, it will only listen for about five seconds before it starts doing its thing. And those are the only five seconds where you can upload a sketch. And this is very different from something like the uh, ESP8266, which is happy to just sit there and wait. All right, so this is where we're gonna get our script. And in particular today, we're going to go after hardtracker.ino. Now, if you have Arduino IDE installed and downloaded, you can just go ahead and grab the raw here, uh, as you saw me do, copy this, and then go into Arduino. And of course we could do the git clone and all that stuff, but we don't really need to. If you ever just need to grab a quick Arduino sketch, it's perfectly acceptable to just grab it from here. So as soon as this opens, we will go ahead and open a new sketch. And from here, I'm gonna go ahead and put a new one, close this one, and in here, I'll paste our code. All right, so let's look at what this does. So first, we're going to include the DigiSpark keyboard library, and then we're gonna go ahead and wait for two seconds and then send the keystroke for first zero, which clears some uh, output issues that can sometimes uh, happen when you first plug this in. Basically, the, the keyboard needs a, a single character stroke or something to get it started. Then we do key space and mod GUI left. So what that looks like on Mac OS is this. That's a default setting. And of course, one of our uh, production managers actually had the uh, default keys on his laptop changed, so this did not work on his. So if you wanna throw this off, you can always just change the default keys and that will mess this script up right away. So after that, we wait for a little over half a second and then we type in terminal, which should in the spotlight search only give us one result, which is terminal.app. So when we press enter, that instantly will launch a terminal window and from there, we can start to do some pretty insidious stuff. Now I'm gonna show you what happens when we enter this in. This is uh, export visual equals nano cron tab tac e. And what this is going to do is in the background, it is going to allow us, oops, okay, yes, allow us to put in a job that will be repeated every so often. Now this is from a previous example, although I'm pretty sure it's the exact same script. I'm just going to put it in manually. So what we're going to do here is schedule a job. And basically by putting star, 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 we're saying every 60 seconds, we're going to send this curl request. So what we're going to be basically doing is taking this payload, which has send the curl request, make it silent, redirect the output to dev slash null, which is basically saying, hey, uh, because uh, HTTP is a response, uh, a requested response type uh, protocol, there's going to be a response. And if you don't do anything with it, the user is going to be alerted to it via uh, a bunch of system mail in the terminal or other sorts of nonsense. So immediately stick it into a black hole is effectively what we're saying, because dev slash null is designed for just getting rid of output that we don't want. Then we're going to pass the referrer variable and we're going to make the referrer variable the sum of everything inside of this parentheses. So what this does in bash is allow us to include a variable and say, hey, we wanna pass the result of all of this stuff as the variable in this command. So uh, in this case, we're making the system call that I showed, which basically gives us every single wireless network, but we're also running it through sed, and then we're running it through xargs. And this is going to make it all one line so uh, it's getting rid of all the line breaks and everything else that would make this difficult to send. And hopefully this big chunk of text can be sent to Grabify. Now we'll also go ahead and put in a Grabify link. And if you haven't heard of Grabify, it is a tracking tool by my friend Joel, who's really awesome and has done a guest episode on Nullbyte before. So if you go to grabify.link, then you can go ahead and create a tracking code. So I'm gonna create one that goes to uh, let's see, nasties.net. Hmm, looks like they can't find that one. All right, they'll have to make it. Um, let's just do null byte. Elegantly short URL. Mm, 
Oh, right, there we go. I was clicking on the wrong button. So then we have to help this AI briefly prepare for the uh, human AI war by letting it know how to take out the traffic lights and where the buses carrying the important people are. And once it's able to identify those, then of course we are allowed to do our tracking. So we're gonna go ahead and head and use this as our example. And in our script in Arduino, we're going to put our own Grabify link here so that we can monitor the output. All right, great. Now we'll need to go to tools. We will go to board and we're gonna go ahead and select the Digistump AVR boards and the Digispark. Now, once we have that all selected, we're going to first make sure that I'm not hanging around in a terminal window. So I will close this. And then we're going to, in my case, plug in an adapter so I can use my USB port. And then I'm going to plug in the Digispark and well, first I'm going to upload the code after I name it. Great, the SQL. And as soon as it says plug in device now on the bottom, we'll be able to run our code into the uh, Digispark. So when it's been uploaded into the Digispark, it'll go ahead and automatically run and we'll get to see if this works. There we go, we're in terminal. Now it's going to basically schedule a Crontab job. There we go, we've delivered our payload very quickly. We've closed it. And now we've closed the parent of the parent of the process. It's done, I can remove this. And now my computer should be reporting my location and my IP address to Grabify every 60 seconds. That was fast. So if you were somebody who just used the restroom at a coffee shop and you left your macOS computer out, you wouldn't know that all of a sudden your computer is reporting its location to some malicious stranger every 60 seconds. Let's go ahead and go to Grabify and see what's happened. This could take a second, but I'm gonna refresh and see if we've gotten any contact. Let's wait a little bit and see after 60 seconds if we get a uh, tracking hit. There we go. All right, we have our first... <laughs> it looks like it might be too long. So I'm gonna have to disable my uh, little protection here. I am protecting against this attack by using a beacon spammer to put out a bunch of fake networks. So let me disable that and see if we can get the real networks that are nearby. After a little bit of trial and error, it turns out the problem was a little bit of formatting. Now here, when before we were trying to send a request, there were some issues with the way it was formatted and without adding a couple extra things to get rid of both spaces and dashes, Bash was interpreting the, or curl rather, was interpreting this as an argument and trying to do all kinds of stuff with the output of our command. Now we can fix this by changing our payload to look like this instead. And I'm gonna go ahead and actually run this so you can see what it looks like and exactly what uh, will happen when you do so. So when I run this, of course, it's going to be routed to silence, so we shouldn't see any sort of return. But when it completes, if we go to Grabify and refresh, then by adding those last two variables, we'll have trimmed out all the white spaces, so it's a little harder to see. Oh, we're on page three now. But this last request has all of the networks that are nearby, which means we're able to see a wide variety of information related to where this person is and what they might be doing. Now, if we see a bunch of coffee shop Wi-Fi networks, then maybe they're at a coffee shop out and about. If we see their home Wi-Fi network, then we know they're probably at home. But this VPN over here really doesn't do them that much good in terms of protection, because even though this says that they're in Texas, I know that they're, well, wherever these Wi-Fi networks are. As I said, this is a pretty nasty attack, so make sure to keep your devices safe, because if somebody puts this on your computer, it'll be checking in every 60 seconds and telling on you for where you are, which network you're connected to, and even just random nearby networks that could give away your location. As this example goes to show, the consequences for leaving your computer open and unlocked could be somebody plugging in something like this.
Now that could track you every 60 seconds and rat out your location, so you need to be careful and make sure your computer is closed or locked when you're leaving it unattended. In addition, you can do a couple other things like modifying the default key settings on your computer so that some of the key settings won't work when people rely on them to launch certain applications. In particular, the default spotlight search would be probably a good idea to change because it would completely derail the script that we built today. That's all we have for this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. If you get confused, you can check out the Nullbyte article linked in the description. And if you have any ideas for future episodes, send me a message on Twitter at Cody Kinsey because I'd love to hear from you. We'll see you next time.